Hello everybody, this is Jamie Kaufman with Milk Allergy Mom. I am an 11 year anaphylactic food allergy parent and we blog at milkallergymom.com and we run this Facebook page for milk allergy uh, community. And today we have on my father-in-law and allergist, Dr. Robert Kaufman, and he is going to talk to us today about how to uh, choose an allergist and how to find a good one for you and build that relationship and what that looks like. So instead of blabbering like I usually do, I'm going to let him just get to it and talk about picking allergists today. Okay. Well, there's a lot of different things that go into picking a good allergist. And people that have food allergies, <clears throat> typically you're really worried about your kid. And, that, and that's normal to be that way. And, and sometimes it's, it's, it develops into hyper worried about your kid, okay? And the things that you don't know are what to be worried about and what not to be worried about, okay? From a medical standpoint. And so all of those things go into where the, the patient is at, mm -hmm. per se, okay? And that <clears throat> when you pick an allergist, <clears throat> and it's picking someone who can help you deal with those things as best as possible. Now, sometimes you're so limited. So the starting point is your, is your, the starting point is where you're at. Yeah, so it's where, where the patient is at. Right? Okay, okay. And then, then going to see an allergist and then seeing how they respond to you and back and forth. Now, sometimes some people are, are limited where they can go because of yeah. insurances or distances and various things like that. And so they don't have a whole lot of different allergists. Here in Springfield, we have, I don't know, four or five different allergists. Um, and so people can go pick whichever one seems to fit their personality a bit the best and <clears throat> works with them and they can develop a relationship. So that, that's where being in a group, a support group like this with Milk Allergy Mom is very helpful. And I refer all of my allergy patients, food allergy patients, to go to Jamie's website because whether they're whether they're milk or not milk, whatever they are, are because it gives them the idea, the concept about what's going on and what's happening, and, and then then you can get a lot of questions answered in those sites. Right. But there's one problem about those sites. One thing that's probably good at is helping you figure out where you are as a parent. Exactly. Your that's mental, true. your emotional, where you are at with your child being diagnosed with food allergies and what you think about that and how you feel about that. If you're more, because I know in our group we find there's the laid back parents mm -hmm. and there's the more, you know, high strung parents. Totally, I'm one of those. And so the groups but really help you. You're getting more laid I back. I am getting more laid back, right. yes, because I'm hanging out with other parents and moms who are kind of helping me just find where I, where I lie in all of the spectrum of allergy. It's a lot, it's a big emotional thing. Oh, it's very much so, very so much once so. once you sort of figure out where you are, and there's not a lot of people locally to be hanging out with no. saying, hey, we have food allergies, all right. How, how do you handle it, and what do you think about it? But getting online is just so wonderful now. It wasn't here when, <laughs> that's why I started Milk Allergy Mom, because I thought, is there anybody out there doing this? And so over a decade, it's we've grown, food right. allergies have grown. So yeah, that makes sense. So you start with where you are, and one way to know where you are is to be hanging out with other allergy parents. Exactly, right. And so when right. we all look a little different, that's a good thing. Oh, We're yeah. not all the same, oh, yeah. and we don't all have the same opinions and thoughts, and that's a good thing. Right. Great, okay. Okay, so that's kind of the, the starting point of doing this, okay? Mm -hmm. And then um, most allergists are, are pretty well trained, okay? Um, now, whether or not somebody's board certified, that can go for lots of different reasons. Like, I'm not board certified by the American boards. I'm board. I'm certified by the Austral Australian board. Okay. We have Australian friends. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and why why that worked was that worked out for me because of my age. I didn't want to go back and do a fellowship and everything else. I could do a bunch of stuff online and with them, and it worked out real well. I've talked to them numerous times and various other things. So, uh, and I did that not because I needed the information. I mean, the information I learned was maybe helpful, but I pretty much knew it all anyway. Um, but what it was, it was more for billing and purposes like that, okay? Um, and so having, having board certified, not board certified, is not necessarily always good. Um, 
the board certification says that yes, I pass certain standards, I know certain things. Does that make somebody a good allergist? Well, it's like anything, you know. Somebody can be very good at book work, and yet they can't deal with people very well. Right. Somebody could have gotten their college degree and not have a job, and somebody could have not gone to college and have a really great job. Exactly. It's a similar principle. Right. Because when it comes to patient care, especially when it comes to food allergy, you have to have a relationship. There's got to be some type of relationship there. So let's let's say now, so you've got that, and, and you've been able to establish that, and then it's looking also for what are, what are you interested in and what is that allergist comfortable doing. Okay? Right. Because OIT is not a recommended standard of practice by any of the American associations of allergists. So I have around. to explain what that is because sometimes okay. we have people on who don't know all of the acronyms okay. yet. So OIT is oral immunotherapy. Correct. Where you're desensitizing the allergen the allergy that somebody has. That is correct. Right. When you do that by feeding them bits of that food or bits of that protein, depending upon what you're using. Right. We're giving shots if it's environmental. Exactly. Shots are environmental. Well, oh, shots are not Oh, OIT. that's not OIT, right. That's okay. desensitizing. That's, it. that's SCID. Okay. Subcutaneous okay. immunotherapy. That's why I got him for help. Okay. So the overall picture is desensitizing, and then within that are food desensitizing, environmental desensitizing. OIT is food. Right. And... Whatever you just said for shots is environmental. Yeah, skip. Okay. Okay. S C I T. Right. And, and so you the, were saying some don't. This is not a. Everybody is not doing desensitizing. No, especially not the oral. Okay. Right. Okay. Not everybody does that. Okay. Um, the that's in America. Okay. Overseas, uh, it's more common. It's more common in Europe. They've been doing it for years over there. They've been doing oral desensitizing in Europe. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah it's I much didn't more know common. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's much more, uh, it's accepted over there in lots of different places. Okay. Okay. And it's gradually probably going to be accepted here in the United States. There's a lot of research being done by drug companies right now looking at developing the actual proteins and protein powders. And we're actually doing some of those studies. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing for people that are really allergic to, to like peanuts that can't even eat a partial bit of a peanut, can we give them a peanut patch or can we give them... Uh, some peanut powder in a form because we can make that so small and so diluted. Right. Is there uh, any way to desensitize? Exactly. We're looking at If they can't just things. eat it, just find something. Exactly. Okay. okay. So that's what they're going at. With and not every doctor in the United States is doing that. No, no. There's. I think there's only maybe 47 places in the world that's doing that. Wow. Now, right now. With 47? Uh-huh. Huh. Yeah. It's, it's not very many. Cool. Yeah, some some not stuff. Cool. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. it's not very many. that's just the way it is. Okay. Um, so people are gonna have to really travel to come see you guys. Well, it, it depends. I mean, see, we're we're very much into research, as you well know. Mm -hmm. I've been in research all my life, and I love doing that. Mm -hmm. I love figuring out what's going on, and then I love taking the research findings and and putting those into the individual right. patient, the clinical, okay? right? the clinical situation, mm -hmm. exactly, and mm -hmm. applying that, and using the clinical in situation then, and what the response is, to go back and look at the research, and what can we do different, what can we do, that kind of thing. So, finding an allergist, okay, sometimes you're stuck with, okay, I don't have a greatest relationship with my allergist, but they, they really do know what's going on, mm -hmm. okay? The other thing that I mentioned last time we talked a little bit is, and I had this problem, okay, people that are going to allergy are usually pretty smart because... Doc, people that go into allergy... As a physician. As a physician, as a okay, physician okay. yes. Who are physicians, mm -hmm. allergists, are, are usually intellectually really sharp, mm -hmm. okay? The problem that you have with people that are intellectually very sharp is lots of times... Socially, they're not so good, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. And they don't know how to read people. They don't know how to uh, see if somebody's understanding something or not. So when they're doing the explaining, Explain things, it's right? hard for them, okay? It's hard for them to do that. And and I'm constantly amazed about what the public doesn't know still. Right. I mean, and I've been doing this for 40-plus like years. Exactly. <laughs> yes, my good one, good one. It was like, oh, I didn't know she didn't know that. And she's very knowledgeable about lots of this. So, uh so we, we always fight that battle. And as I tell my patients, I say, you know, um, this is going to take a while because it, it's a relationship that has to develop. You're trying to tell me what's wrong with you or with your child, okay? Mm -hmm. 
and I'm trying to help you tell your story in a way that makes sense to you and to me. Mm -hmm. And then I'm trying to get the information that's in my head into your head so that you can understand what I'm thinking about and how I'm looking at it and how I'm seeing this, okay? And how Just, we move forward helping and, your and child. Then, then what we do and, right. and what to expect as we do right. the different things, okay? And so it's kind of like what we're doing here right today. It's this developing a relationship, developing mm -hmm. those kind of things. So that if you don't have that kind of relationship or the, their allergist has difficulty doing that, but yet they're really sharp, okay? And you can usually tell that. Uh, by talking to other people, by mm -hmm. uh, how being they, in the group, being comparing in the group, notes. Us moms like to compare notes. What the other their other <laughs> patients are doing mm -hmm. and things like that. Talking to some of their other patients. Yeah, and locally, and locally, town. Exactly. right, right, right. right. That's that, true. Yes, all of that kind of thing, and you get you can get an idea, and then what you do is you go to the groups and help help them get that bouncing off back and forth. Right, in okay? our online groups. In the online yeah, groups. Yeah, just sharing right. what kind of knowledge and right. relationship you're getting. Because so, I, I suspect in big cities like Cincinnati that there may be enough people there to where they could actually have their own mom's milk group. Okay? Right, right, right. Uh, but most people don't live in places like that. Right. Or even if they do live there, they don't know where they are, they don't know how to get to them, they don't know things like right. that. That's where the online things come in. Right. Stand. I probably know like five moms in Springfield. Mm -hmm. You probably know of more here in the office. But So the first thing to start with is where are you at as an allergy mom and an allergy mm -hmm. family and an allergy child? Just where are you at mentally, and emotionally, the allergy physically? Is. Yes. Right. What's, your, what's going on with you guys? Then um, the second point is Finding an allergist that, I mean, you want somebody that knows, is knowledgeable and oh, yeah. smart, right, right? right? And then um, the next one is then, yeah, so you're kind of saying that maybe knowledge trumps a really, really personable doctor. But it, some people, that's really important. That, that's true. And see, that goes back to where you are. Okay? Right. If it's more important for you to have the relationship, okay, then you really need to seek that out. Okay. If it's more important for you to, like, I want to go to the person that really knows the most, or even though they don't explain it, then I'll do that in the groups, that's fine. Because I, some moms will just do what we're supposed to do and just trust the doctor, and we don't have to know every all the behind, like, why and how. Right, right. We just kind of want to know the who, what, when, where, do it, and then we trust that it's going to work. Some right. moms are fine with that. Oh, that's right, and that's great. And then yeah. others like me, I've been picking Dr. Siri's brain for mm -hmm. 10 years. I want to know why, what next. Why did you think this? Mm -hmm. And she's been really good to explain that to me. Mm -hmm. So with Dr. Sear, I've been lucky to have somebody who is knowledgeable and personable enough to really explain. Right. And, and, and put that knowledge in, in a form in which you can understand. Right, right. So what about, so he, you were talking about desensitizing. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's some families who really want that. And, and their maybe allergist doesn't do it. And their allergist doesn't do it. Or right. maybe there's somebody who their allergist is pushing them to desensitize and try new things. And they don't want to do it. And they just want to avoid. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we, us moms, just think we're right. And we know our kids and we think this is the right thing. Mm -hmm. What do you do then? Well, what I would do then is if, if you really want to go to OIT, that's when going and getting consultation someplace else makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay? Going to somebody who does OIT and getting some type of consultation as to whether or not your child is a candidate. Because your first allergist may be really good and is recognizing that you're not a very good candidate for undergoing oral immunotherapy at this point because mm -hmm. of various things. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Just like with Miles, <clears throat> that I recommended, I said, let's don't do oral immunotherapy now. Let's first get his environmental taken care of. And then let's do his oral immunotherapy. And these are the reasons why. And it finally stuck with you. Right. Okay. Even though I've been finally saying that sense. for yes. several years, it finally, yeah. boom, it happened. Okay. Yeah. And, and so, so that's where a consultation comes in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just now, go in and talk to them. And just go in and talk to them. See, see if, if you are see a good if match. My, my child is a good candidate for this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we know that when it comes to uh, oral immunotherapy for like, uh, peanuts and for uh, milk, uh, that there are certain characteristics, both clinical characteristics, um, uh, laboratory characteristics, etc., that say this person is mm, probably not going to do well with oral immunotherapy. Okay. Yeah, you were just telling me in our last thing inside the group about our total IgE number, which mm -hmm. I didn't even know was a thing. Mm -hmm. 
So, and so there's a whole lot of information that, that goes into that. That you know that right. maybe we don't know. Maybe you exactly. didn't tell us. Right. right. And right. we need to really make sure there's a good reason of right. why they're doing things. Right. Exactly. Right. right. And somebody, you know, we, we know that kids that have had uh, anaphylaxis before to whatever food, when they go through oral immunotherapy, they're more likely to have difficulty than people mm -hmm. that didn't have anaphylaxis. Mm -hmm. We just know that that's true. Okay, so then, but that doesn't necessarily preclude them from not getting oral immunotherapy. Right. You have to look at all the other things that are going on, right. okay, and say, is this a good situation now? What can we do to improve this situation so their oral immunotherapy more, more likely might work? Mm -hmm. Those kind of things. And that's where you go to somebody who's a consulting person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have we already talked about how there's just some allergists who are wanting to move in that direction and willing? Because desensitizing means you have to really work closely with the oh, patient. Yeah. I mean, I've even heard like they have to be on call. So if you're oh, doing yeah. your dosing at home and something happens, the allergists that are doing desensitizing are really, really invested in oh, yeah. Every step for you, like twenty four seven, somehow, yes. whether they have a nurse set up or something, are there are just some doctors that aren't going to do that? That's right. right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and you know, some and they're people, not required to. There's no. just no. an extra layer, like we call our support group, an extra layer that some doctors are willing to do. Right. And if you're going to do oral immunotherapy, a uh, physician, if a physician is going to do that, yeah, you have to have twenty four hour access. Wow. With some in some manner, okay, mm -hmm. through some some manner, and and some people go into allergy and immunology just because they don't want to do that, okay. Mm -hmm. So they don't want right. to be on call right. twenty four hours a day, okay. And and I understand that because I did high risk OB before, and it's like I don't want to be on call twenty four hours a day, right. So that's why I have partners. That's why we cover for one another. We do different things. We have one person in our group that Dr. Sherry. She doesn't mind taking calls whatever the time of night is. Okay. Yeah, she's awesome. And. and then she she's a night person, various other type of things. When it comes to morning, she just should not be there. So I cover all the mornings. Yeah. I mean, all the time. So it's like, yeah, it's like it's having newborn day. babies. Exactly. Yes. The office has to be willing to have somebody on call at all times. Well, I was thinking about being at home. You know, mom gets up at night, dad takes care of this. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, I was the night owl. Jeff yep. was the morning person. Yep. Um, is there anything else before I go through the list of things our support group? We well, asked our support group for some questions ahead of time. Yeah, so. there's, there's one other okay. thing, and that is that there there are some people that they're they're really pushing oral immunotherapy, and they um, they take all comers and they say you know for this amount of money you can do oral immunotherapy. A doctor will say that. A doctor will. Okay. Do there's some offices that are just doing that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, the only thing I said, some of them are really good. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of those are really good, and they're really good physicians. They're really doing a great job. Is that what right. they do? Like that's that's they, that's a big part of their okay, practice. Okay. Okay. Um, the only thing you got to be concerned about that is again individualizing. Okay. Right. Wh right. Whether they're just going to run a straight protocol and everybody does the same thing, or do they individualize, or mm -hmm. do they use a protocol and then they make variations off of that protocol as necessary? Because the one thing we know for sure is that you can't, with oral immunotherapy, because of the complexity of it, um, and just like take milk, there is, uh, there's casein. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's casein, there's beta-lactoglobulin, and there's alpha-lactoalbumin, -lact lactalbumin, mm -hmm. excuse me. Those are the three main ones that can cause allergy in milk, okay? You didn't say whey. Well, whey is it includes the lac, the beta and the alpha oh, lactic Oh, okay, okay. And, and lactalbumin. Those are in that one, okay? Casein is in the other one. Okay. Okay? Now, on the casein, there are four different kinds of caseins, okay? Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the albumin, mm -hmm. okay, the the uh, lac, alpha lactalbumin, there are two different types of that, mm -hmm. okay? And then beta lactoglobulin, it is not present in breast milk, but it is present in cow's milk. But a person who is drinking cow's milk that has beta-lactoglobulin in it can have beta-lactoglobulin in their milk. Mm -hmm. And you kind of experience that, mm -hmm. with possibly with Miles. But it also Being may... Being crabby all the time. Exactly. Yes. But it also may have been casein. And there's different forms of casein. There's alpha, there's beta, there's ga uh, kappa, and I can't remember what the other mm -hmm. is. But it's not an allergenic... The beta casein, okay, is higher in cow's milk than it is in breast milk, mm. okay? Alpha casein, different story. We, we won't go there. Let's just look at beta casein, okay? My That's support all. group, people are going to like this because we were talking about breast milk the other day. Okay. 
And in beta casein, there's two types of beta casein. Mm -hmm. There is the A1 and the A2 types of beta casein. Okay. Breast milk, if they're not drinking cow's milk, uh -huh. they're not drinking other mm -hmm. milk, will only have the A2 casein. Oh. Okay. So are you saying when we cut out dairy and we're breastfeeding, it does? It, it, it changes. Okay. Okay. The, the, but also, the, because the A2 casein that's in cow's milk is different than the A2 casein that's in breast milk. Mm, mm. Okay. Interesting. Okay. That's I did why, not know all this. That's why. How you many know, knew this? <laughs> breast, <laughs> milk, breast milk doesn't cause allergy to a kid. Okay. Okay. Typically, breast milk never causes allergy to a kid. But it's what the mother is eating that can get across, that, causes, that gets in the breast milk that causes the allergy. Right. Okay. And that's what we saw with Miles. Right. That he was you... a totally different kid after I oh, cut yeah. all milk. Which but milk? I cut all milk. I mean, if it was on a box of crackers that there was milk in it, I didn't eat that. You have to. Now, was... we're, now we're starting to look, too, at whether or not these can be antigenic. Maybe there's all kinds of other things that we will get to in a private group later on. Right. And okay. so you're saying it's so complex. It is extremely complex. So if there's an allergist saying we can desensitize kids to... To anything Case across the board, no right. problem, everything else, I'd be a little concerned, okay? Okay? If somebody says that, well, most of the time we can do this, let's take a look. Ah, that's a person. Right, right. Jump and if it's going to take time, and, like, this is going to take us quite a while with oh, you yeah. doing this, oh, but yeah. we know it's right. going to hopefully... And so that goes back to picking the allergist, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And picking the cons person to consult for the allergy and that kind of thing. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, Judith, she only has, she lives in a really small town. What if you only have one allergist to pick? Uh, that's, again, where, where, the, where you go to that allergist, you see what kind of relationship. If it doesn't seem to be working well, it seems to be doing something that you don't want to do, that's where you say, okay, well, I'm going to make the trip to a big city or a bigger place and see this allergist. Okay. So and just, just a kind of consultation, see whether I'm a good candidate for it or not. See, I've been spoiled. We've never had to travel. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Like, how often should you go to an allergist if you're traveling to them? I mean, if they're desensitizing, that's a little tough, right? Well, the, the, it's phone thing and the desensitization, the, I think the furthest one we have away from us right now is 250 miles away. Okay? Mm -hmm. we've, we've gotten patients over 500, 600 miles easy come to see us for consultation. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, and uh, then what we do is we outline things. We talk to their allergists. We talk to them about their allergists, where they want us to talk to. We deal with all those social oh, issues. Oh, so you can just go consult somebody just to pick somebody else's brain but not have them be your doctor? Exactly. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, we do that a lot. Oh, and then you just work with their doctor to say... We, we do a second opinion. Sometimes they want to work with their doctor. Sometimes that doctor wants to work with us. Sometimes they don't want to work with us. Right. <clears throat> and so then we work around whatever we need to work okay, on. Okay, that's cool to know, oh, yeah. though, just to have another professional opinion. Right. Right, okay. We have people that drive, oh, three hours one way to see us all the time. Right. That's off. We're so spoiled. I know we are. That's why we're sharing you with everybody. Okay. <laughs> So I was like, this was too good not to share. So consults don't even mean that you have to take that person as a doctor. You're just getting more, no. more information. Uh, you're getting a second opinion, for your consult for, to see whether, and, and when you make the call, it's, it's good to say, hey, we've got this problem. I want to come talk to see if we can possibly do X. Can that be done over the phone? Oh, yeah. You do that over the phone when you first talk to the people. And, and the person making the, the, the scheduling will know whether they're, whether that physician wants to do that kind of thing or not. Oh, okay. Okay, and then if they do, they'll say, sure, come on in or whatever, or let mm -hmm. me talk to the doctor first mm -hmm. or whatever, and then you just go from Can there. the doctor tell by the notes if they should talk to him on the <laughs> phone or have him come in? Like, you know, if somebody most has really the, bad eczema, you would want to see that. Most of the time, I have them come here. Okay. Okay? Because, and then, then we also have them get all their records and everything else so that we can do it in one visit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to... Uh, sometimes we have them come, we do the one visit and everything else, I get the records, we can do everything with a call. It, it just varies. It, it varies. depends on the situation. Yeah, okay. And you know other doctors all around to hook them up with somebody close? To, is that? I don't know, maybe not. Well, we, a little I, know, bit. I know a lot of doctors, right. but I don't know if I know all the doctors. Right, no, you don't know yeah, all of right. them. Yeah, okay. Um, somebody in the group asked about immunologists, pediatric allergists, is that an even better layer to have when you're getting an allergist or well is uh, it all... the allergist immunologist is um, they're going to be looking at a lot more things mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. than just an allergist, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, what we're doing, this is immunotherapy, so it's a little bit different than allergy, okay? It involves concepts that, that are immunology concepts as well as allergy concepts when we start talking about oral immunotherapy. Is Dr. Siri an immunologist? Oh, yeah. She is? Oh, yeah. She's, oh. Allergist. She's board certified in both. So, so I come to an immunologist and I didn't know it? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. We might have to cancel this video when we're done. All right. I think I knew that. Allergy and immunology. Uh -huh. your office. Okay. I get nervous on live and I ask stupid questions. Well, that's fine. And then a pediatric allergist. Dr. Sear was never pediatric. I just knew she was really good with kids, though. There, there is no subspecialization in pediatric allergy. Okay. okay. That, that it's a, whether or not people want to deal with pediatric patients or not. So, like, my sister was a dentist. She wasn't a pediatric dentist, but she loved working with the kids. And so they let her take all the kids... And so she was kind of known as a pediatric allergist, but it's just because she took all the kids but had no training or specialty with it, just That's right. lots of experience. That's right. Is that the same thing? Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, there, there are some places where you can do uh, some extra training and stuff for pediatric allergy. Oh, a little bit? Allergy, you know, okay. Things. But you don't necessarily need that because the, the basic mechanisms uh, of allergy and immunology are the same for humans, okay, across the board. Now, if you take humans versus other animals, it changes, okay? And, and a lot of people don't know that, but I just do. Okay. <laughs> Are uh, we talking about breast milk again? <laughs> <laughs> well, no. yeah, we, we could be. We that. could be, but okay. it doesn't matter. Um, but so when it comes back to allergy immunology, yeah, an allergy immunology person uh, is, is keeping up on both of them. They know both of those areas. They understand that. They have the intellectual curiosity and, and, and things that... Like whole body system sort exactly. of stuff? Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. So when we see Dr. Siri, she's looking at the whole oh, body yeah, system. Oh, yeah, we always do. Yeah, yes. okay. That's why we always ask... Uh, so is it important to have an immunologist then? Is that what you're saying? Well, it, it you don't necessarily have to because there are some people that, don't, that aren't immunologists that are very good with oral immunology. But they know immunology. Oh, they know. And they it. apply it. They apply it. But things, they don't have that. But title. they don't have the Okay, title. okay. So that comes into your consults and exactly. getting to know them. Exactly. If they just even know the whole the information they That's need. Right. right. Yeah, because my sister knew how to work on kids. I'm sure there were nuances to that. Oh, yeah. And There's a difference between yeah. baby teeth and there is a yeah. teeth. And she, you learn those things, but do you want to deal with those things day in and day out and various things? Right. Okay. So very good. So, um, immunologists, not necessarily important, but it's important that they know the concepts and work with you in that way. Mm -hmm. Pediatric allergist isn't, there's not any really big subspecialty no. with that. It's just a little bit extra. Right. Okay. And you want your, them to be good with kids. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> Obviously, exactly. us moms want an allergist that's going to be good with kids. Yeah. Um, if our kid's the one with the allergy. Sometimes we have adults on here with the allergies. Yep. And we talked about consults. Um, will a good allergist refer you to nutritionists? GI specialist, will you get referrals from them? Well, uh, yes and no. Okay. Okay. Um, we have great relationships with a bunch of nutritionists and GI people here in town mm -hmm. because there are certain people that we want to refer over there because we think that they have EOE, uh, esophageal esoph mm -hmm. uh, eosophic esophagitis, and we want to get them scoped, okay, for that. Uh, we work closely with them. They work closely with us with the allergy things back and forth. And that's GI? That's GI. Okay. That's a GI. Uh, with the nutritionists, we get more into the nutritionists when we have people that have a lot of different food allergies and they have limited diets. Right. Okay. And that's when we go with that. We have people that deal nothing with uh, nothing but breastfeeding and formula feeding and kid feeding and all that kind of stuff. And we get into that when there's all kinds of problems with somebody who can't breastfeed for one reason or another and we got to put other kind of formulas and that kind of stuff in. So, gotcha. Because so, you got to feed the kids. So the, that. <laughs> You don't have to have a uh, referral for that. Most of our patients don't get referred for that, but if they do need it, yeah, they. If there's a need for it, there, exactly. that is a plate. That is something that you, a good doctor, a exactly. good allergist, would be able to do because oh, yeah. he is building relationships exactly. in the area. Right, because okay. you, you you'll need those people. Okay, and your allergist would probably know if you need that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, an allergist should know if you need that. Okay. Okay, and if you they don't, you just talk to them and then. They, and you can raise the different questions, and that's where it right. comes in the support group again of having, and that's one of the things your your support your uh, uh, specialty group that, mm -hmm. that you're doing is going to have. I'm going to be on there a bunch talking about different things uh, and various things, uh, because not everything that you get online do you want to believe. 
Yeah, I kind of learned that. Okay, and even in your group, right. that there are people that right. write things that it's like, oh, should I respond to this? <laughs> I can't respond to this in a nice way. Well, when you have 8,000 people in a Facebook page, I mean, I you're going to get lots of different things. So that's why we're really excited about the support group, because it is an extra layer of membership, and we just are opening it tomorrow officially. We're starting it, and it's a small group, so we can really get to know each other and know where people are coming from and the information they're sharing. And, and is, in that group, I'll feel a lot more comfortable commenting on things. Okay. Whether or not what that person's saying makes sense. Right, right. Makes they're sense. all really, really Because um, they're, they're invested. Yes, they're exactly. invested they're in invested learning. In they yeah, want, they want they to know. learn. They, right. Otherwise, they wouldn't be paying the money to join. Right. They want to learn. And that's what I love is open-mindedness and willingness to learn because yep. we don't know everything. Right. I sure don't know everything. And you learn a lot when you're in a group of everybody just sharing. Right. And food allergies is so great. There's hardly any right or wrong answers. But you know... You know some things that are right or wrong. So there are some things that we know are right or wrong. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so this one was kind of funny. Like, how to fire your allergist. Oh, yeah. Well, Somebody actually asked yeah. that. You don't have to send them a letter of notification or anything like that, okay? Give them two weeks' notice? No, you don't have to do that. Okay? <laughs> you don't have to do that. What you need to do is just make an appointment with another allergist, okay? And go see that other allergist and talk with them. Because you may not want to fire that first allergist. Oh. After you go see that second allergist. You may say, oh, wow, well, that first one was a whole like lot better. Like the grass than the is greener one. on the other side exactly, of the Exactly, yes. Okay, okay, that's a good idea. Keep your options open Keep before you, before you burn, your burn your bridges. Burn your bridges, exactly. Okay. Go see them, see if then if it works better. You know, talk to other people in the community who've seen the various ones. Mm -hmm. Go see somebody mm -hmm. else and see whether it's not going to work or not. But the ball's in your court. But you yes. have the ability to pick your doctor. Yes, yes. Thank goodness. Uh, how about the websites that recommend doctors? There's there, some out there that say these are the best that do this, these are the best that do this. Can we, should we be picking our allergies by those websites? Um, there, there are several different ones that are out there right now doing that. Okay, do I belong to any of them? No. Okay, I, I don't. You must be bad then. I must be bad. Yes. <laughs> okay, I must be bad. Uh, Doctor Sherry belong to No, she doesn't. Right. No, none of us here belong to any of them. Um, there are there are good people that are in them, and there are people that uh, may not be so so good. Um, that um, one of the things that we do in our office is that um, we uh, we individualize therapy all the time, mm -hmm. and so we individualize charging all the time. Mm. Okay? We don't charge a flat fee saying I'm gonna oh. do. It's twenty. We're not doing the twenty five thousand. Pay us twenty five thousand dollars, and we'll go oral immunotherapy mm. for milk for you. Mm. No more cost. Right. We don't do that. Right. Okay. We individualize it to the patient. And I can, tell, I can assure you this, that most of the time when we do that, we do the individual office visits, everything else, it comes out to way less money. Than right. That. And we try to do it in such a way that it's covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Siri's always been good at that. Oh, yeah. yeah we, that, that's one of our primary things. and Because um, so, if we're paying for insurance... We would yeah. like to be covered under it. Be, exactly. If we and, at all can. And insurance won't cover typical oral immunotherapy. Oh, gosh. We've got to talk about that, don't we? They won't cover that. So we're going to talk about OIT in the group sometime. There's like three main topics that are hot right now, mm -hmm. so we have to pick. One is um, oral allergy syndrome mm -hmm. and all the pollen in summertime and fresh fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. It's kind of. We'll be doing that soon. Let's I think we should. Yeah, I do too. And then the second one, we said that we were going to do food challenges, but do you think we should do the oral allergy syndrome before food challenges? I don't know. We'll okay, we'll talk about that. And now, oral immunotherapy. We have to yes. talk about that too. What, what did you just say that made me go off on that trail? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, the charging, charging for it. Charging for it? The, the insurance. 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 Pay. Right. Sometimes your private, uh, what's that called? Your private. Uh, bank account that you have for just oh like health savings the health savings account, savings account. sometimes some health savings accounts will let you use some of that money toward oral immunotherapy some of them won't so why isn't oral immunotherapy covered because it's not an accepted practice by any of the organizations that, that of allergist immunologists in the united states okay it's not considered standard of care yet in the United States. Gotcha. And we're not like mad and bashing and mean about it. It's just not just the oh. thing that's just a fact right now, right? Well, it, it, I'll go back to this. 
when I was in 1980, I made some discoveries about taking care of pregnant women uh, that had uh, diabetes mm -hmm. and how to manage that diabetes, gestational diabetes and various other type of things, and did a whole bunch of papers and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And that became our standard of care here at SIU School of Medicine uh, by 1985, and we've been doing that ever since. It never became the standard of care in the United States until 2007. Really? Yes. Huh. It took 30 years. So you had paved the way for diabetes and pregnant women? Mm -hmm. Gestational diabetes and pregnant women, the way to manage them, the way to, to take care of that, to minimize the, the uh, adverse outcomes for the baby mm -hmm. okay, and for the mother. Um, and that was our standard of care, and we've been practicing that for 30 years before it became standard mm -hmm. of care in the United States. And so this is what... And this is where OIT we are with OIT right, right now, right, right, is that it's somewhere in that 30-year process. It's getting closer to the end, but uh, it's still got a ways to go. Right. I mean, in our, in, in our public page and on our website, we really talk about all the different things. I mean, we've been doing strict avoidance forever. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, we that's talk right. about all the different things, but it is that we are now doing the, we talk about the desensitizing a lot because that is what we're starting are. to do. And just as leading this community, we're just talking about it more. And so I sort of started the support group knowing that the private support group that people are paying to be in now, knowing that I could talk about like our private stuff with that in a group and knowing that so many people would want to know about it, but I don't want to put it out there for, out there the for everybody exactly. you know like we might have some really tough things that we go through with that mm -hmm. and I want a tight-knit community that will be my support too mm -hmm. in that so mm -hmm. that's sort of we aren't like a hundred percent you have to do desensitizing we know no. it has to be personalized but we just talk about it a lot there, just to let people of, know where we are there are a lot of my patients that I, I'm not doing desensitizing yeah. I'm not planning on doing okay, desensitizing okay. you just desensitizing. knew Miles was a good candidate for yes it. okay good to know that's awesome I love doing these videos with you. I think that that's it. That sounds good. I don't know how long we've gone. So but summarizing back. Yeah, back let's the, summarize. That's okay. good. I like summaries. How to pick analogists? Well, find out a little bit about yourself, where you are, what you're doing. Okay, where what do you feel about things? Then finding an analogist who really knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you do that by talking with them and then talking with your support group, getting a support group that you can bounce some of those ideas off to see if that makes sense. Anybody else doing that mm -hmm. around here, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And your a local community and too. Your local community. Online, as well. local, right. Yep, all that. And then also that if you really want to do oral immunotherapy and your allergist doesn't want to do that because because they don't do it at all, okay? Then it's going to getting a consult. Mm -hmm. Or if they say, no, you're not a good candidate, but yet you're still willing to do it, you want to get a second opinion, you go get a second opinion. Right. Okay? And that second opinion, when you go there, you can either decide, yes, I want to transfer my care over here mm -hmm. and just see this person, mm -hmm. or I just want that opinion, then I'm going to go back to my other doctor, whatever. Right. And a good doctor would take that input. I mean, two good doctors would talk together about a patient and say, most of the time. I recommend, most, I, of the time. most of the time, okay. There are some times where professional jealousies get in there, but mm. I don't Is that, with those. People were asking about red flags. Is that a red flag? I don't know. I mean, they can still be a good doctor, even if they don't want to be like a team player, I guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's not necessarily a red that's flag. That's not necessarily a red flag. Are there any red flags? I forgot that was a question. Anything that would make you go, ooh, I should really not be at this allergist? You said a one-time fee. I would, I, I would, one time somebody fees. that says, I can cure it all. Yeah. Or I can handle this. Right. Without getting the information. Mm. You know, I, I, I never say that I'm to anybody that... You won't even tell me that. No, I won't. <laughs> I, that, I, that this is going to be successful. This is, this is going to take care of it. Because I just don't know. Right. Okay. And somebody that says that, that's, that would be a little bit of a red flag Okay. Me. That's good to know. All right. Well, if you guys have any more questions, go ahead and leave them here in this post and we will come back and take a look at those. Sometimes yep. it sparks new conversation yep. ideas for future videos. Dr. Bob is on in this uh, Facebook page, this public page. Once a quarter is our schedule, so he won't be back on here until September. I've got my calendar right here okay. to talk to your office because um, we do carve out his patient time so we appreciate that he does this and it is a big deal that we can have him here sharing his knowledge and then in our private support group he is on once a month we have a whole list of topics 
for him to do like a Q&A with us. Mm -hmm. And we do it just like this, but it actually happens inside the group. And uh, he is willing to do that because I think just personally, you're kind of on the OIT mission with us with Miles and you mm -hmm. just want to help people. I just like to help people. Yeah. I just like helping people. We make a good team. Yep. <laughs> All right. So if you want information about the support group that we mentioned a couple times, I'll leave the link for that. And if you have any questions, anybody, just leave them here and we will take a look and uh, hopefully be able to answer some of those for you and get some more future topics to cover with Dr. Bob. We hope this was really helpful. And we really, really hope that you just find a good, figure out where you are at with your food allergies and find a good allergist that is a good match for you. And if they aren't, do a little bit of extra uh, work to make sure that you do get one that is a good fit for your family. Yep. All right, we'll talk to you later. This is Jamie with Milk Allergy Mom reminding allergy parents everywhere that we are in this together. Bye. Bye-bye.